Um, I'm Joy Mighty. I'm the new um, Associate Vice President Teaching and Learning. I'm happy to be here at this first round table because you were here, one, and secondly because I'm happy to welcome and, and introduce to you Richard Wiggers, who is a senior, no, I'm going to get it wrong, so I better just read it, <laughs> Research Director at the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario. And as Research Director, he's responsible for managing large research projects that are um, sponsored, shall we say, by HECO, both at the university and colleges. Um, he's responsible in particular for student services and teaching and learning. And he's done a, a lot of other work related to um, HECO's wide-ranging research projects. There are several projects that HECO does, um, including an, something that's ongoing, a multi-institutional research project on work-integrated learning. Woo, sounds big. I think the thing that most of you will be interested in is the fact that he is a Carlton alum. <laughs> so we are happy to welcome him. We will forgive him the fact that he did his master's at that other capital <laughs> university, that other university in the capital. <laughs> and he did his PhD from Georgetown University, so um, where he also held a, a Shirk doctoral fellowship. He's done a large number of presentations and publications, and we are really honored and pleased to have him. So please join me in welcoming Richard Vigors. Um, this is actually a bit of a homecoming for me because I used to live in Glengarry House. I think they still call it Glengarry, do they? Yes. Um, and, uh, and actually, I did start my master's here. I finished the coursework at Nipsia and then went over to the other side and finished a master's at, at the University of Ottawa. So it is a bit of a homecoming. We've also done a number of research projects and have a number underway with Carleton as well. Um, but really, I'm talking here today as a teacher myself. Um, this fall marks the 20th year that I've taught um, college, undergraduate, or graduate courses. And in fact, I'm currently teaching my 81st higher education course. Um, so I represent <laughs> that world of itinerant, part-time, sessional faculty as well. And, um, and in fact, uh, two of my first teaching experiences were right here at Carleton, doing undergraduate courses. So it is very much a homecoming for me. So what I'll be talking to much, uh, today uh, is very much also guided by what I've seen as an instructor in the classroom over the years. Um, the other thing is, I am a first-generation post-secondary education student. I'm also a first-generation immigrant. Um, and I do have a real passion for teaching and learning. So uh, I really appreciated this opportunity to talk with you and to hear back from you as well some of our observations from me research and whether it reflects what you're seeing in your own classrooms. So the first thing I wanted to do by way of introduction is to talk about the many faces of being an instructor. <laughs> so my parents, who don't know much about what I do, I like to portray, uh, if any of you haven't yet seen it, this is a wonderful movie, and I like to portray myself as the nice bearded gentleman teaching the intellectually brilliant and student with potential. Um, on the other hand, uh, my friends, I like to portray what I do there's something along these lines. All the students there at the front of the class paying attention to every word I say. On the other hand, I suspect that for many of my students, this is what they see. <laughs> and in fact, I'll show you some comments later that suggest that's the way some of them see me. What my colleagues think I do, the ones who don't come from the academic world, <laughs> and it is an old movie, but it is a good movie, uh, what I like to think I do, <laughs> but what I actually do. <laughs> and in another two weeks, I have a whole weekend blocked because I have to get the grading done in time for the students, and I will have no social life that weekend. I will not go to any Christmas parties. This is the reality of being a teacher. Um, but it's a wonderful reality. And um, so what I want to do first is introduce the other side, is my HECO side. So HECO, for those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, we're an independent agency of government. We do research in partnership with colleges and universities, and we try our best to influence government through that research in terms of developing more effective policies and allocating funds more effectively and enhancing quality and global competitiveness. 
So we are independent. We get our funding from the province. We're actually physically separate as well from the ministry. Uh, you know what they say about real estate? It's all about location, location, <laughs> location. So um, it is really wonderful because it gives us that distance. And I think we've come to be seen by many institutions as that honest broker. We're not within the ministry. We're not part of the ministry. Uh, but we try to represent the research as best we can to the ministry and to the government. So our three main research priorities are these three, but they're not mutually exclusive. So anything that has to do with access generally has to do with quality. Anything that has to do, do with quality normally will also have to do with accountability and vice versa. So it's not mutually exclusive. There's a lot of crossover. And um, in the past four years, we've actually uh, started to focus quite a bit on quality, quality teaching and learning. So in fact, one of the first projects we ever got involved with was this one, which was run out of the University of Toronto, where they looked at course evaluation forms. And it's my understanding that as a result of that report, which was done, University of Toronto has completely revamped their course evaluation process. And they're now trying a whole new approach to course evaluations. And so uh, even if it was at just the one institution, it seems that some of that background research did have an impact in a positive way. Another early study uh, looked at the gap between expectations and reality. So this was interesting. The title is interesting, Bessie Fessie Nessie, because that's the name of the three instruments that were used, the beginning student engagement survey. Uh, anyway, it, they're called Bessie, Fessie, and Nessie. So what they did is they surveyed the students coming in. They surveyed the students again at the end of their first year of study, but they also surveyed the faculty. And the gaps were what they called the expectation gap or the disappointment gap between what students expected coming in and what they claimed to actually experience by the end of the year. And the perception gap between what faculty thought the students were getting and what the students reported they actually experienced. So when you look at this table, you'll see the disappointment gap in the blue between what they thought at the beginning of the year and what they actually got was highest in terms of out-of-class interaction and course interaction with the faculty, and the perception gap was also highest there between what faculty thought they were getting in terms of interaction and what the students claimed that they were getting in that first year. So that was kind of interesting, and it was, it was an interesting model, especially about the first year shock. Because everyone knows, it's out there in the popular media, about the large classes and the difficulty in getting quality time with a faculty member, and yet many students are still coming in shocked or surprised at how little interaction time they have. Um, and another study we did, um, this was at six universities, uh, where we did a survey of faculty finding out where did you learn? Where did you do your learning? How did you learn to be a teacher? And I, I would say my experience reflected this. For the most part, they learned by doing. You get thrown into a classroom. You think you have some ideas. You may consult with colleagues. But for the most part, you learn, and you trip, you fall, you pick yourself up, you do it again. And over the years, you develop your own. Um, so the fact that so many of you he are here today for a symposium like this is encouraging. I think a lot of institutions have tried to provide more and more support to faculty so that they're not isolated, trying to figure out how best to reach students, how best to teach, and so on. Um, then we really emphasize teaching and learning much more significantly uh, with the publication of first this book, which mentioned the issues of teaching, class sizes, and so on. But in particular, um, and this is an appropriate place to introduce it, uh, this book, which as I understand it has become required reading at a number of graduate courses now, and has gone to third printing, it's, it's really, I think, ca captured a lot of attention. Now, as a result of these books and then the projects we launched, we also realized that there were many faculty and student service providers that are out there trying to do innovative things, trying to help students succeed, but they're not really fully aware or they may not be trained in how to do assessment and evaluation. So what we did uh, this fall is we published a manual uh, which was endorsed by both STELI and Caucus, the Student Service Association, so they're national publications. And the idea is to say if you're a faculty member or a student service provider and you're trying to do something innovative or you want to refine your practices, here are some basic things to think about when you're doing that assessment. 
And this hopefully will become a living document. We hope to revise it next summer. So we're also asking for feedback and input from people on how to make the next edition more helpful to users. Um, and then as a result of those publications, in particular um, uh, the um, Taking Stock, we started to launch a number of what we call micro-projects or individual research projects. Uh, so we had, for instance, uh, one report we did on teaching and learning in large classes, another one on teaching stream faculty, the role of new faculty orientations, which is being uh, led out of, out of Carleton University, and then teaching and learning centers. And they're all on our website, uh, available for review if you're interested. And then we have these projects as well. We have a dozen projects on large classes, one of which I believe is here at Carleton, Another dozen projects underway currently at Ontario colleges and universities on technology-assisted learning. Again, I believe one here at Carleton. Uh, professional development, we have, I think, eight or nine projects now underway on how different colleges and universities are tr trying to prof uh, provide professional development to their faculty and to their teaching assistants. And then we also have a number of reports that have either come out or will soon be coming out on graduate enrollment expansion, uh, doctoral programs, the challenges the doctoral graduates are facing in the labor market and so forth. And we also did a, uh, several mega analyses using NESI as a survey instrument and as a measurement tool. And then we have several learning outcomes projects underway. So in one case where we uh, partnered with eight colleges and universities to pilot the collegiate learning assessment, which is an American instrument here in Canada. In another case, um, we're working with the OECD to try to find a common um, outcomes measurement tool for civil engineering programs. And in the last case, in tuning, we brought groups of faculty together. So for instance, in the social sciences, we brought a group of about a dozen college and university faculty together to try to develop a common set of learning outcomes for all levels of higher education. So two-year, four-year, masters, and so on. Fascinating exercise, watching them, and actually they found much more common ground than I think many people expected. So really interesting projects. Um, and the Ontario government is also increasingly, as is the public, as are the newspapers, as are parents. But if you think of just the example of the Drummond Report, for those of you who uh, recall when it came out earlier this year, there were a number of provisions there where they also focused on issues of teaching and learning quality and provided suggestions on some things that could be done by post-secondary institutions. And most interestingly for me, we will soon be getting a report from the Auditor General of Ontario, which undertook an investigation at three Ontario <coughs> universities, UOIT, Brock, and the University of Toronto, and their report on uh, faculty, um, uh, how uh, teaching or, or faculty performance is assessed will be out later this winter at some point. And it'll be very interesting to see um, both what they say and how public reaction um, responds to it. But what I started to uh, come to more of an awareness of, we focused more and more on what faculty are doing or are not doing or should be doing more of. But there are a number of factors that go into learning success or student success. And so the, what I'll be focusing on in most of the rest of my presentation are some of the other factors that you need to be taking into consideration when you're sitting in front of your classroom or online with your classroom, uh, some of the other challenges that students are likely facing in terms of success, whether it's in your class or your program or your institution. So we've done 17 projects on student services already. We have a number of projects either completed or underway that look at course-based interventions and teaching and technology and large classes. But there are other factors. There are institutional factors, the nature of your institution, policies at your institution, and there are student factors. There's a new generation of students in our institutions. They're facing different pressures than previous generations may have faced as well. And so what we're trying to do is get a better understanding of some of those factors as well. So I'll start with um, the institutional factors. And one of the interesting things um, 
Nessie reflects this. This is a different survey that I'll be showing you. But essentially, if you're at a smaller campus or a smaller institution, there's a greater likelihood that you're going to feel a sense of engagement. And students who want a sense of engagement are also more likely to go to a smaller institution or a smaller campus. <coughs> and so when a survey was conducted, this is a national survey, the Globe and Mail survey, what they found is that students who were at very small institutions tended to most feel that there was a very supportive environment. And students who were at very large institutions tended to most feel that they were expected to take care of themselves, to be independent, that there was not the same supportive environment. So depending on the nature of your institution, it will probably have an impact just in terms of its size um, on the engagement or the experience of the students that are there. This is something external to what you're doing in your classroom. This is part of that environment that the students are living in. Other administrative policies can also impact on decisions that students are making. So think of it, if a student starts a course in the fall semester and a few weeks in realizes the course for one reason or another isn't a good fit for them, but if your administrative policies are very strict in terms of when you can add drop a course or in terms of getting a refund, it will probably make a difference in terms of their decision of whether they're going to switch or take uh, the credit and take another course at the same institution later or whether they're just going to drop out. Because if they've been told you can't get a refund, it's too late to switch, they're more likely to say, well, then I'm gone. I've lost my money. It's, you know, it's gone. And so in one study, which is being led out of Brock University, they did find that course withdrawal dates, uh, tuitions and tuition refunds impacted some student decisions, had an impact in terms of those student decisions. So again, um, if you're looking at your retention rate at an institution, this can make a difference. And that's why you'll see more institutions that are looking at strategic enrollment management. It's not just a matter of recruiting students. It's all the other things an institution does to help them along the way and to get them through the whole process. This is one of my favorites. One of the key performance indicators of the government, as it has been in the, in the K-12 system, in the post-secondary system, has been retention rates. And so when you look at the retention rates here from year one to year two, and then you look at the institutions, and of course all of you are waiting to see where Carleton ends up, and it's right in the middle, right? And it is a goal of government that students, if they're coming in, should stay. They should continue their studies, hopefully towards graduation. And so by that measure, these institutions here should be rewarded, right? It's a question, is it? If retention is a goal, and retention is a good thing. Mm -hmm. But it could be a result of really uh, what getting out. It could be that. It could be. But if you're going to make it outcomes-based, yes, they should be rewarded. If that's, I mean, yeah. we may or may not agree with that goal, but if that's mm -hmm. your objective, then yeah. of course they should be rewarded. Because if retention is a goal, and, and the public perceives it as a goal, yeah. and someone starting and not finishing is a bad thing. Yeah. And I think the key thing is, what's, what's impacting retention? Is it, real, is it uh, what the school is doing, or is it other factors uh, in educational research? Socioeconomic status is a huge mm -hmm. uh, uh, predictor of various things. And so those things, the institutions don't, uh, mm -hmm. don't generally impact. So you don't want to reward them just for having what we or <laughs> for showing, okay. Uh, what other? Because the interesting thing is, when you line this up with retention, or with, uh, yeah, the retention rate here, and the entering GPA across the bottom, look what happens. Carlton's again in the middle. So the institutions with the highest retention rate also have the highest admission average. And the institutions with the lowest retention rate have the lowest admission average. Where is the public good? 
what does the public want? What is one of the other things the public wants? Because they also want retention. Easy access. They want access. Mm -hmm. yep. My argument, and I'm not necessarily representing HECO or the government here, but if the public good is access, which I think most people would agree, these institutions are the ones doing the public good. They are serving the broader access population. I would argue that you don't give the rewards to those institutions, which actually in somewhat have an easier time of retaining. You need to give it to these institutions that have students that are more academically challenged, that are more marginal, that are more non-traditional, right? So we have to think beyond simplistic measures of anything in terms of performance. And by the way, what's the matter with someone starting a post-secondary program and realizing it's not for them? Why is it always a negative, especially if they go somewhere else? But there are student factors that contribute as well. And this is one of the things that I've become intrigued by, not just as a step-parent, uh, but as a friend of many people who have kids who are post-secondary age, as a teacher as well. Um, so let's start with applauding ourselves. Canada leads by far the OECD. This is non-university. I'll show you university in a second. But non-university, that is college, apprenticeship, all the other types of university credentials, Canada is by far a leader. The OECD average and the United States, our two logical comparisons, are on the right-hand side. So look at the comparison between Canada in non-university credentials. And then when you add university to it, Canada is a leader in the OECD in post-secondary credentials in our population. In the population, I don't remember now the age range, but this is the adult population. We have a lot to be proud of in this country. We have done an incredible job in comparison to the United States, in comparison to the OECD average, and in comparison to every single OECD country. Ontario has done better yet. If you look at Ontario's rate, so you start with trades and apprenticeship, you add college, which by the way inclu includes private career colleges, and if you add university, the Ontario goal is 70%. In our youngest population, age 25 to 34, we're already at 67.5% of earned PSE credentials. And that was based on, I believe, the 2006 census, and the data for the 2011 census will be out in the new year. We're likely to be even closer already to the 70% goal. And one of the questions I ask is, how many of the remaining 30% ever really want to go? And if the goal is 70%, in the younger population, we're already attaining it. So again, kudos to Ontario and to Canada. But, uh, and students are more satisfied. I, I always find this fascinating. Now this is based on an American study. It's a longitudinal study that's been done over 30 years. But I'm fairly certain if you look at the KPI surveys here in, Ca in Ontario, they're fairly similar. So overall satisfaction tends to be high when you ask students about their PSE experience. And satisfied with teaching, this is my favorite. When you read the KPI surveys here in Ontario, most students will rank quite high their experience in the classroom. When you talk to your friend's kids at a Christmas party, you will not hear that. I find it interesting. There's a disconnect between what the surveys, which we base a lot of our measures on, and what I'm hearing over and over and over again. So there's something happening. Now this is American data, but I think it's fairly similar in Canada as well. Now this is interesting to me, because if you look at the GPAs, now this again is the US, and it's interesting because there's a case going on right now here in Ottawa where they've been trying to get the grades for both Carleton and Ottawa U to see if there's been great inflation. I'm absolutely convinced there has been. To me, there's no question about it. And the U.S. study certainly suggests there has been. Because as more students have entered the system, the number of students with A's has gone up exponentially, from 7% of the total to 41%. And the percentage with a C or less has gone down substantially while we've broadened the population. It doesn't make sense. There's a disconnect. And this is my favorite. 
the proportion taking remedial or remediation courses has gone up substantially. So they're getting A's, but many of them are taking remediation. And they all work hard at their studies. <laughs> and I'll get to that as well a little bit later. So there's some disconnects. There's a lot of data that says different things, but they're not always consistent. And they don't, they sometimes fly in the face of what I see in the classroom. There are, and part of what's been happening, um, and I see this in my friends and uh, with my stepson as well, there are increasing numbers of what we call helicopter parents. Now that's the more benevolent version. <laughs> There's now something <laughs> called Black Hawk parents <laughs> because they come in guns blazing. And I hear this from registrars in particular at colleges and universities, and it is increasing. This trend is growing. And in part, this is resulting in more what we call bubble wrap kids. And this is my favorite. <laughs> so I, this is my own speculation, just from what I've seen, a little bit on studies as well. But why the shift in parent parenting? One thing I think <coughs> is there are growing fears, especially with younger kids. You hear all these cases, they're in the news again in the last few days of children who were harassed, who were molested and so on. There's a lot of dangers out there and there's a lot more awareness of the dangers. But there's also more affluence. There are more parents who have more money and smaller families. So when you have a single parent with a good income and a single child, it's much more easy to help them financially than would have been the case when you had a family with four or five kids or three kids. So there's more affluence, there's more availability of funds and resources to help. And there's social pressure. Parents that I know that have tried to have their preteen kids go to school on public transit will be accused of being bad parents by work colleagues. It is horrible. Parents who expect their kids to pay part of their post-secondary education will be accused by work colleagues of being bad parents, of not loving their kids. This is a shift. This is a shift. But this is the social pressure that many parents are facing if they even contemplate doing some things that would be contrary to the norm. Technology. Think of it. Uh, according to the American studies, two-thirds of university students today contact their parents by text or or, uh, or cell phone, or in some way, at least once a day. When I was here at Carleton, <laughs> thank God they didn't have cell phones or text <laughs> messages. Long distance was expensive. And if I had to call my mom, or she would call me usually, but it would be maybe on a Sunday, once every week or once every second week, thank God. Uh, it was just a different generation. But technology has allowed more interaction. And so now you see students in their 20s who will not make decisions about courses and so on without consulting parents. It's, it's a real shift in generation. There are more parents with post-secondary credentials. My favorite saying is a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. So because parents have experienced some aspect of post-secondary, they think that 20 years later they know all the answers about post-secondary. And it's not necessarily true, but it is a reality that's out there. So you get parents that are telling their kids which program to take and which institution to go to. And I get them all the time. I teach history, liberal arts. I have students from science who take my course because they're passionate about it. They're some of my best students, but they're not allowed to major in liberal arts because their parents are paying their tuition. And to me, it's a shame. It also causes an engagement challenge because you're sitting in front of a class with some students at least who are not there out of free will or out of preference. That creates a challenge. And this is my favorite. An amazing ability to forget. If I talk to people of my generation, they'll brag about the factory work, the farm la labor, paying part of their own tuition and so forth. And yet as parents, we want to love our kids, we want to protect them, and we want to help them. And really the message is, it is being done from love. But it is creating challenges for young people who are going to post-secondary. And add to it the fact that in Ontario we eliminated grade 13. 
And now we're also trying to eliminate the victory lap as an option for people to help in their transition. So it creates challenges at the post-secondary level. And so what happens is it is not financial pressures that lead students to drop out or switch. And this is only one study. There's four different studies that all show the same thing. The biggest single reason students drop out or switch is because they didn't like it, it wasn't for them, they wanted to change programs, and financial is often further down. And like I said, I can give you all kinds of other studies that show essentially the same thing. When they survey students who have dropped out, it is because it wasn't the fit. It wasn't the right program for them. It wasn't the right institution. Again, it's not a bad thing, but it, 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 they haven't necessarily been able to think through what is the right fit for them when they come to post-secondary. And please, I welcome comments. Doesn't it mean there should be a little difference between Canada and the U.S., where people don't have to choose their programs or their majors until their third year? And so should, shouldn't there be uh, higher retention rates there? If, 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 if your hypothesis here is correct. But there are other, so, like even in the U.S., there's two-year, uh, there's four-year institutions. There's a whole number of different types of institutions as well. But interestingly, there are a number of universities here that, that have moved here towards a general first year to say, let's not uh, streamline them too early in the process. And I do think that's actually one way to give a broader, more, more solid foundation in the first year and then stream them on from there, but give them more time to test out uh, a number of options. Um, I was just going to add, one of the reasons that the students don't like or think it's not for them is because they have failed to make a connection, a personal connection, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with any teacher, yeah. whether it's you know, a faculty member or whatever form of the teacher comes in. Yeah. That they've failed to make a connection, therefore they don't feel really that, they, that anybody cares or that they belong. That's, that's what the, the big, so that first one can be broken down further. Yeah. I mean, one of the challenges, though, is when you create peer-assisted study sessions, peer helper groups, things like that, there's often relatively few students who take it up. There, there are things that are being created at institutions in response to those, the research and the, and the understanding that students need engagement. But again, there's that issue. And I, I still say that's partly because we do have a generation of younger people who do need more encouragement. They need to be... Uh, encouraged more to take advantage of the opportunities, uh, which is why their parents stay involved with them often uh, into their post-secondary as well. Uh, and there are challenges uh, on the mental health side. There was um, a cover story in Maclean's magazine this September that talked about the fact, and the uh, Colleges Ontario just came out with a study. One of the student associations in Ontario also came out with a study. There are more younger people that are facing emotional challenges um, when they're coming to college and university. Um, Overprotective parents may think they're helping their kids, but once these kids arrive on campus, small problems can seem overwhelming. And there's a real challenge for many young people um, in terms of that. And there's another book that just came out that I think is really interesting. Um, this is actually a U of T alumni who just gave a presentation on this at U of T as well. Um, it's not just smarts. It's the ability to stick with a task that makes a difference. IQ matters a lot in terms of what your freshman GPA is, but graduating from college has much, to do, much more to do with character strength. And I'll give you an example. When I went to do my doctoral program, I did not have the highest score on the GRE. As you can tell, I'm not a brilliant intellectual, but I am stubborn and I am determined, and when I start something, I finish it. And I went there with a purpose. I went there later in life. I had taken a pause, worked for a while. I knew why I was there. Many of my truly brilliant colleagues, not just that they scored high on the GRE, but you can tell after 10 or 15 minutes conversation how intellectual and brilliant they are. At the time, I used the term they ran out of steam, but it, they ran out of, or they didn't have, or they ran out of grit. That matters too. There's another aspect to finishing post-secondary that also plays a role. Yeah. But isn't that beaten out of students in the high school system? Because in the high school, si well, in the elementary school system, you're passed by your chronological age. Yeah. And then you hit secondary school in Ontario, where you don't actually have to attend or do anything until June, and then you can do all the makeup assignments. So when they hit university, where there's a completely yes. different paradigm, yeah, it's it's really not fair. Yeah. Because they've been given 
a, a different expectation for 10 years of their yeah. life, how can you change yeah. immediately? So those structural factors um, are huge yeah. and very unfair, I think, to, uh, to young people. And that's where we need to have more conversation across the sectors, because if they're not as ready, and then it means we may have to build, at least for the transition period, more of those kinds of supports in, because it's unfair to them, exactly. So if you're sitting in a classroom and you're seeing some of these challenges, you have to understand that many of the students haven't had the opportunities to learn some of those coping skills yet. And, and it may, but the problem is it can add additional responsibilities to an institution that already doesn't have the funding to do some of its core business. But it is a challenge. It is a challenging world. Um, and then uh, this also raises the problem or the challenge of non-traditional populations. So if you look at the university uh, population, uh, this is based on Ontario data. Um, and it's interesting that women are far more likely to look at university as the option, as are immigrants. There's a real, including my family. My family were all tradespeople when they came here, but they wanted their kids to have a better life. Actually, my parents had a pretty good life, and so did my aunts and uncles. They were tradespeople. But there was this perception, and there continues to be among many immigrant communities, that it has to be university, not college. And then you see other groups that are less likely to choose a university. So for instance, Aboriginal students and disabled students are more, much more likely to view college as a more appropriate option for them. So it is interesting. And then when you look at retention, so this is get getting in, this is those enrolling in. But when you look at retention, uh, so the red line will be the average um, dropout rate, basically. And the blue line will be the actual for each of those different communities. And if you look, there are certain populations that have a much higher dropout rate than the average. Disabled students, first generation PSE, low income families, first generation of immigrant, and male students. This is another thing that's become of interest to me. When you look at the gender gap, two thirds of undergraduates now graduating overall, and this isn't just Ontario, it's happening across Canada, across the United States and Europe, are now women. The majority of students in master's and doctoral programs are now women as well. There's been a shift that's <laughs> happened, and in fact, there's quite a literature out there on some of these challenges. Um, I don't hear about a lot of programs happening at colleges and universities targeting male students, um, but I do think it's a discussion that's worth having, because what I often find is that female students are much more likely to show up at class, to do their assignments on time, to pay attention to detail, um, and so forth. Um, and there has been, and, and it may have always been that way, but I do find it, it's a fairly, it is a fairly stark difference. And it's not across the board. There are always exceptions. But to me, I have noticed some patterns and trends in that as well. Which brings us then to the issue of how much learning is actually going on. Because even attending or retaining, staying, what really matters is are they learning while they're there. So part of the gender gap I just talked about might be able to be explained in terms of study habits. Males are much more likely to have irregular and unpredictable study habits. This is based on an American study and not to like books. And females are much more likely to have strong habits in terms of reading and books, taking careful notes and so on. So there are gender difference in terms of behavior, in terms of preparing for classes, uh, doing homework, taking notes and so forth. Um, and what's interesting is uh, one of the things I hear often from parents is we're paying for them to attend so they don't have to work. Their full-time job, my son or daughter, is to study. But a student study, uh, this was done, I believe, across Canada, where the students reported the amount of time they spent per week on their studies. And these don't get added. This, the total time studying, is added within the red. So their total time in class and doing homework is not even the equivalent of a full-time job. And these are the best students, and then it goes down by GPA. So many students are spending some time going to classes and so on, but, and then, of course, well, it's because they're working. Stats Canada data recorded over the last number of years shows that the majority 
of students are not working part-time at any one time. Now, that doesn't mean at some point in the year they might not be, but whenever you take a snapshot, the majority of university students are not working part-time jobs. It will vary by age, by program, by where they are. The other interesting thing is, look at the huge gap. Women are much more likely to work part-time jobs than men. Less than a third of male students are working part-time jobs while they're full-time studying. And who's doing better academically overall? And every study I have seen, or most studies, I've seen some that have differed, suggest that working part-time, as long as you don't go beyond a threshold of 12 to 15 hours, is actually not a negative in terms of your academic performance. And in fact, other student surveys show that the A students are far more likely to work part-time jobs than the C students. So unless all the data is wrong, you know, this is um, somewhat of the reality in terms of uh, what's happening with students. And what's, because we've broadened access, because we have a much broader population, uh, this is a study that was done out of Waterloo. And what they did is they looked at deep learning and surface learning and so on, and then they categorized students into eight categories. So it's ranging from those who are gaming the system, trying to do the minimum amount of work, to those who are really there to learn, who are really curious and who are trying to learn a lot. And what I did then is I took some of the comments that students have given to me over the years in terms of my teaching and kind of mapped it onto it. Now, my overall um, uh, course evaluations on average are 4.2 out of 5. Only one time was it just below 4 out of 5. And there are students who've taken my courses who have enjoyed it, who felt they learned something. There are other students Who will, put, <laughs> who will put that on rate my professor. And it's been out there on rate my professor for years. And that's fine because I'll read it out to my students when I start a new course and tell them, I'm a teacher and I'm committed to your learning. If you want to learn, I will help you learn. I will read drafts and I will do everything to help you. If you're here not to learn, you will hate me. And there are other courses available. I'm not afraid to say that, because I care. And I don't really worry if students are going to libel me, because that is libelous. Like some of the things there are pretty brutal. And I'm, maybe some of you have experienced it as well. And that it's done publicly surprises me. But it, it is what it is. And I, you know, I don't worry about it anymore. I used to get really apoplectic earlier. But, but there are challenges. You have students coming in. This is one Ontario college that shared their data with me. Year over year over year, 60% of their incoming students, direct entry from Ontario High School, can't meet the college English requirements. And they have to figure out how to provide remediation to them. And I'm sure it's the same at universities, except we can't get data from universities. But you are facing some challenges like that as well. So we have students who are coming in with academic challenges. And then there are these issues which relate to what we call digital natives. Um, they expect quick responses from faculty. Um, we don't always have our Blackberries with us, especially not necessarily our student accounts. Um, the plagiarism issue, which I see over and over again. Technology uh, is invading the classroom, so cell phones, text messaging, laptops where they have Facebook on and so on. Um, and this was interesting, and, and I think it reflects what I've seen. Um, we do have to spell it. I'll give you one example. We, uh, in my own office, we have some younger employees that we hired, and they're great people, one male, one female. I was driving back from a meeting recently and found out that all of our job searches, all of the CVs and so on, are on our uh, shared uh, drive. And for whatever reason, they hadn't been locked out. I didn't know that until then. And these people had gone in to look at their job search and had looked at the other people who applied and so on. I would never have thought to do that. And it's not that they're bad people, it's just that the rules are not as clearly laid out. And the interesting thing is they are willing to follow rules. We have to lay them out more clearly, which means you have a syllabus that could be a mile long. 
but it, it's not an aversion to rules, and it's not necessarily rebelliousness. It's just things that we take for granted we have to lay out more clearly, and plagiarism is an example of that. I think if many of them understood why it's so bad and what it is, we would see less of it, but we need to do more in terms of providing that understanding. I'm going to skip through this except to talk about this. In a study that was done in the United States, so what they did, before we go there, but what they did is they took a population of students who graduated from university, so they had an undergraduate credential, and they took two different ways of measuring what they had actually learned, so how much, how much knowledge, how many skills they actually had. So they had two different instruments, one's on the right, one's on the left, and then they looked at what impact it had on their unemployment rate. What you will see is that the more they learned in whatever measure was used, the more likely that they had a job. The less that they learned, at least according to the measures used, the more likely that they were not employed. We have to start reminding our students it isn't the degree that gets you the job. It's what you learn while you're doing the degree. And, and I do think we have commodified, um, including our institutions, have commodified the credentials too much and have forgotten what it's really about. So a few ideas. Um, we used to focus about on access. Then we started looking at retention. What's the use of getting them in if they're not staying? Now we're jumping over to employment, and we're saying, well, if they're not getting a job, well, when did a credential guarantee you a job? It never did when I came out. It is not the job, especially of universities, to directly link. And one of the things, have any of you heard of the University of Regina guarantee? The University of Regina is actually guaranteeing jobs to their graduates. And by the way, this is what I find really funny about it, if they don't find a job within six months of graduating, they'll give it, them another year of free university education to make up the skills. Now, they can do that in Regina because the labor market is really good and the economy is really good right now. But I also think this is starting to move institutions into a further commodification of the credential. I knew somehow that my bachelor's in history from Carleton was not going to lead to a job at the end of the <coughs> stage when I went to my graduation ceremony. Why did we get to the point now, a generation later, as parents, that we're telling our kids that? Um, what I think we need to measure, not just are they graduating, but did they acquire skills? What are their learning outcomes? What was the value added from the time they arrived to the time they left the institution? Which is why we're looking more at things like learning outcomes. Is there something happening along the way, whatever that something is, that's giving them the beneficial experience that will help them in whatever their pathways end, end up being later on? Um, so some of the lessons from our previous research, especially in student services, there are a number of great interventions out there that we think that the target population is aware of that they're not aware of. We may think we're putting it on the website, it's in the calendar, it's in the orientation, but it's often coming at students at a time when they're overwhelmed with other information as well. Whatever the reason, there are many studies where even the institutional people who were doing the intervention were shocked because this had been around for five years, for ten years, and yet the awareness was still low. And then even when there is awareness, the people who often take up the interventions, like the peer-assisted study sessions and so on, are not usually the target population that you created them for. They're not the ones on the margin, the C minus, the D plus. The students who often show up to get the help are the B, B plus, A minus students who recognize they have challenges, who want to get a better mark and are willing to go and get the help for it. And the other challenge is, and colleges are facing this with literacy, if you ha have students who are at risk and you make something compulsory, that creates a whole other set of challenges because you have people in there who don't want to be there, who feel insulted at being forced to be there. So you have an environment that isn't very helpful to begin with. So we have to think about how do we approach those students who are academically at risk or who need help. But you know, I don't think coercing them or identifying them and say you need this or have to do this is necessarily the solution either. But I don't know necessarily what the solution is. But it's still valuable to get the B plus students in this yes. into the services. You know, even if it's not who you're targeting. Yeah. And in fact, it's interesting you say that. When I first showed some of our student service results, 
which showed utilization was fairly minimal and the people who took it. The first thing one of the administrators said, well, then we don't have to invest as much in student services because in the end, it's reaching too small a segment and not necessarily the target segment. And I said, no, no, not at all. Because if you have students who want help, who recognize they need help, and who are willing to get help, you can't cheat them of it. It just means you have to work on refining it. Absolutely good point. And, and so, if the results of our research, because the interesting thing is many of our studies actually when uh, unexpectedly to the people who did the intervention, sometimes even show a somewhat negative impact, which doesn't mean it isn't working. It may mean that you're using the wrong measure, that the measure is too short term. You know, and so I always tell them, look, if that's the, what the results say, that's what the results say, but I will come to your campus and talk to your administrators to tell them that it may not necessarily mean it's not working. It may just mean we haven't measured the right thing. I still believe in my heart that most of these interventions are the right things. They are, and, and we have to keep in mind, most of them are workshops of a few hours or four or five hours of peer-assisted study sessions. We can't expect them to change everything in, in a, a noticeable way. But tiered on top of each other, the creating an environment where the student doesn't feel abandoned, especially in a generation of students that needs to not feel abandoned, they can make a difference. And so, as I said, if our funded research ends up not helping you make the case, I'll come to your campus to help you make that case. Because, but good research still needs to be done. Uh, and impact. The fact is, and that goes back to this very point, what we have found over and over again in the research is that the easy fixes are not necessarily there. It is the layering of them on top of each other that may make a difference. But everyone wants to show that there's a significant uptick in the performance of students because of this intervention or that, or because I brought hybrid teaching in as opposed to traditional teaching. That's another example. We have at least three studies that show that the new hybrid version taught by the same professor using the same curriculum actually had a somewhat negative impact on student performance. It doesn't mean hybrid isn't good. It may just mean that it still needs to be refined or that the prof still needs to ha know how to work with it. But digital technology is not a silver bullet either, which brings me to then this. Integrate technology where appropriate, but the faculty need to know how to use it as well. And it's going to take a while. The first time I had to use D2L, the desire to learn, or WebCT, I'm sure my first year using it wasn't my best year. It takes a while. And if you're going to measure it the first year, you may not get the same results. So you have to keep in mind there's an adaptation, but it's not always the best solution anyway. By the way, there was another one where they introduced a hybrid version. And uh, in the year they introduced it, in the course itself, the student performance was actually lower. But in the program, it was higher. Because the hybrid course became the flexible course that students could pick up when they had the time. So they ended up, apparently, we don't know for sure, but the speculation is that they focused on their other three or four courses and picked up the hybrid one when they had the opportunity because it was developed to be more flexible to them in terms of their schedule. So just because it didn't have a positive impact within the course, it may actually have a broader positive impact. Does it still make it worth doing? Unsure. Strive to engage students, and that's where uh, the, the book, uh, Taking Stock, is really focused on that as well. And it is essential. This is a different generation of students. They don't just want to be talked to. Um, but maintain high standards. I don't care if students insult me, think I have issues, um, and I'm a control freak and so on. I really don't. I used to care a lot more. At this point, I don't. Um, I am there because I want them to be able to graduate with skills that will help them further down the road. But you have to articulate clear learning outcomes. I have always used a rubric in the humanities. That's a rarity. But I believe a rubric uh, for essays and so on is a good thing. But it is something that, that many faculty are not comfortable with. But that helps me then give transparent assessment because it helps me be very clear to the students, again, the need of guidelines, what I will be expecting, how I will be evaluating it. And when they get it back, they know how they did. And I tell them, I welcome you to tell me. You can't come to me and say, 
look, this isn't a B paper, it's an A paper. You have to tell me, could you reevaluate it? And in this section in particular, this is where I feel I didn't get the, the grade I deserved. But this idea that you know, it, it is an A paper, well, I know why it's an A or a B paper, I can tell you. So you have to tell me where you think it isn't. Teach the fundamentals. Uh, I'm a humanities person, so I see far too many people with two or three post-secondary credentials who can't write a cover letter. That should not be happening. So there is something not happening at our post-secondary institutions because I do all the job searches at HECO. This is a problem. Um, pay attention to the other basics. There's nothing wrong with saying there are deadlines. And I have deadlines too, by the way. So I tell them on my syllabus the dates they will get their essays back, which is why my weekend is booked. Because it's not fair to tell a student that they have a deadline if you don't impose a deadline yourself. And that happens a lot. Plagiarism, even though I'm a sessional faculty and I may not be hired back because of it, I will give the maximum, um, whatever it is, warning or discipline for plagiarism. I see far too many cases where students are simply uh, they're told you have to rewrite it or you get a zero on that assignment. Plagiarism is far more than a rewrite or a zero. It is a serious ethical issue. And I believe that it should be made uh, an issue that you take seriously. And if it means I don't get hired back to teach there again, that's fine. So, um, and this is the last I find really interesting. So, students, Ontario students, this is an USA survey at six institutions in Ontario. Integrating technology is not necessarily the most important thing for students, although I'll talk a bit more about that. Prominent researcher isn't necessarily the most important in terms of an effective instructor, nor doing well. You know what? I am a tough grader. I am tougher than the norm. But my average course evaluation is 4.2 out of 5 over a number of years. Students can appreciate a tough instructor that sets standards, but that isn't inconsistent about how they apply them. But interesting, well-prepared and organized lectures, enthusiastic. There are way too many faculty out there who will tell their students, and I've heard it at least from students, both K-12 and post-secondary, who will tell their students, I didn't want to teach this class, but I was forced to. <laughs> or I don't want to be here either. Or so <laughs> on and so forth. And it happens. It is out there. And enthusiasm and passion. But this is where the ability to communicate in multiple ways. I think this is where the technology disconnects. Because I do believe you do need to use some technology. Although, for my courses, I still find the blackboard helpful at times. Because it allows me to make really horrible maps that they can laugh at and so forth. But I still can use traditional technologies as well. One last thing. So students were asked, this is a different survey, from 3M, the 3M National Teaching Fellowship. So students were asked if they could give one piece of advice. I just picked a few of them out. Please don't become a teacher. <laughs> this is my favorite. And think of it yourself, because I've seen adults come into a room and be motivated when they come out. I've been. I went to um, a conference last year. There were 2,000 people eating lunch in the room, but the speaker was fantastic. And, and it just I've cited him a number of times. You know, you don't need a small class, but you need someone who cares and has a great story or a great storyline. This is my last one. And this is why you're here. You're a lifelong learner. You're the teachers that students can get something out of that they appreciate having. And this is my own particular thing. Words matter, especially in a university. So could we please change the language? It is not a teaching load. <laughs> it is not a teaching burden. Release? Release? From what? <laughs> University teaching isn't a burden. I have done 81 courses, and I'm trying to find ways to do more. 
because the program I used to teach with is, is being shut down because I love teaching. And I'm doing it on the side, but I love it. It's a privilege and it's a responsibility. And that would be my closing message. Thank you.